Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well done for surviving this far, and uh, most importantly, welcome to our panel on open source software funding. Uh, my name is Kaylin Osborne. I am a researcher at the Linux Foundation and a PhD candidate in social data science at the University of Oxford. Um, before I introduce our incredible panel, I just want to do some housekeeping and say some introductory words. So firstly, on housekeeping, this is the, the shortest panel of the day, and we have 30 minutes. So we'll, uh, our time, time management skills are going to be tested, but I think we can do it. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so some introductory words quickly. I think I, I'm probably preaching to the choir when I say open source software funding or funding is crucially important to the sustainability of open source software. But the question of who should be doing something about it and how or how not are not straightforward questions. So we're ho hopefully we'll dig into these questions during this 30-minute panel. Um, just to kind of set the scene of the kind of ecosystem of open source software, as Deborah mentioned this morning, Log4j really mobilized governments uh, about a year ago uh, because it shed light on the, the, the consequences of an underinvestment on open source software maintenance. Um, so just one example of this is the White House meetings last year, which resulted in the Open SSF mobilization plan, which Brian will tell us more about today. Um, of course, it's not just security that governments care about. Today, we heard a lot about uh, digital sovereignty, uh, also digital public goods. There was an interest in supporting digital public goods that uh, led the US government to set up the Open uh, Tech Fund. And as Paul Keller remarks in his proposal for a European public digital infrastructure fund, which is a mouthful, uh, this inspired models in Germany with a sovereign tech fund the European Commission uh, with the Next Generation Internet Initiative, and I'm more recently in France with the Digital Commons Initiative, so we're lucky to have Jean-Luc with us today who will tell us more about the NGI, uh, the Commission. Uh, of course, it's not just governments, uh, but many nonprofits are involved as well. Uh, we have Rebecca Rumble from the Rust Foundation. They're uh, developing innovative approaches to community grants, and we also have Emmy today who will tell us about what Invest in Open uh, Infrastructure is doing. And also we have philanthropies uh, investing a lot with the futures of Media Network, just as examples. And today we have Govind, who will tell us more about what the Media Network is doing. And also, finally, we know, we know that the private sector has been playing a crucial role. And uh, Paula, I wonder if you have your bell ready, but uh, as we've already heard many times today, uh, the European Commission led a study which found that in 2018, uh, companies based in the EU invested about 1 billion euros in open source software which led to an estimated impact, positive impact of 95 billion, or up to 95 million euros. So clearly, open source, there's a lot of developments in open source software funding. It's important. Lots of players are involved. Um, but yeah, who, who's doing what and how they should be doing it or not should be doing it, and how should we, we should proceed going forward is going to be the topic of discussion today. So without further ado, I'll pass over to our amazing panel. Um, I'll invite them to introduce themselves what their organizations are doing, and to share some thoughts on a first provocation, which is why should, why should Europe care about open source software funding? So Jean-Luc. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Jean-Luc Dorel. I work for the European Commission, uh, so the executive branch of the European Union. And uh, among other uh, many responsibilities, the um, uh, European Commission is responsible for the implementation of the Union budget. So. Uh, it's a multi-annual framework, seven years, one trillion uh, euros. And in this uh, budget, uh, there is a research uh, program called Horizon. And we, I mean, the Next Generation Unit and my, with my colleagues, we are responsible for implementing a part of it, which is called Next Generation Internet. Um, so I guess uh, that's uh, the thing I'm glad to share uh, today with you. Uh, you want me to elaborate on why we are doing uh, or we do it next? Uh. <laughs> yes, but please keep All it right, short. All right, okay. <clears throat> so uh, next generation internet, um, this is, uh, in, in few words, it's, uh, it's a program that is um, in four years of existence now. So we have uh, 800 projects. We have uh, uh, mobilized 80 million euro of budget. Um, we still have uh, 25 million for 2324 24 uh, open for a contribution. And we are focusing on uh, technologies uh, that will drive the internet towards uh, more inclusion, uh, more openness, more decentralization, more privacy, and more trust. 
that's the narrative we push. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of projects. Uh, initially, it was 80% uh, of open source. Now it's mandatory open source. So we move a, a little bit from encouraging to mandatory open source. Um, and uh, open source is, very, is a vast uh, number of things. We are not going to fund, for instance, uh, uh, things that are uh, well funded, for instance, some foundations or some business model that are uh, very sustainable. So we are going to focus on those commons, internet commons, uh, that, will, uh, that will be used as building blocks uh, for this internet that I mentioned. Um, and I can give you a few examples later. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Govind. I work with uh, the Omidyar Network. Uh, the Omidyar Network is a philanthropy organization um, which reimagines critical systems. And we have deployed over $2 billion in the service of uh, better markets, better inclusion. And our focus areas are responsible technology, <clears throat> reimagining capitalism, and our cultures of belonging. Uh, the reason I think why we are interested in open source and some of our examples is um, I think our conscious belief is that technology should be in the service of society. And there's an inherent breakdown of trust today in society. And open source historically has allowed us to think about these issues where people participate and collaborate in very non-traditional ways, where you're decoupling property rights from the value created. Uh, so this is a way to re-decentralize the internet, I think. Uh, away from getting into conversations about Web3, but sticking with how open source has evolved. Uh, it is one of the most important investments that we can make today in our societies. Uh, why should Europe care? I think, um, or, or some of our examples, I think we, we have four examples. One of them is we invest in informing policy. Uh, an example would be an investment in Atlantic Council and Open Forum Europe to think about policy more deliberately. Convening funding, we have set up a $500 million fund and anchored a $500 million fund to think about deliberate open source implementation and enhancing and building communities like the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund here who work at, on security audits. So it's a combination of different factors um, and providing funding and networks to these institutions. Uh, why should Europe care? I think um, every technological revolution is accompanied by a financial revolution. Without a uh, financial way to buy cars, we wouldn't have had so many cars on the road. Without billions of dollars of venture capital, we wouldn't have so much consumer and enterprise technology today. So I think we need new ways, and Europe historically has been very good at A, regulating, B, thinking about institutions. But if you take the other two things that impact ecosystems, which are incentives and infrastructure, it's imperative that Europe, which sits at the center of safeguards and good technological development, leads the way in thinking about the financial revolution in addition to the technological and regulatory revolution. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Amy Tang. I'm the engagement lead at Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, our mission at Invest in Open Infrastructure, or IOI, as the name suggests, is to increase and accelerate investment in open infrastructure. Um, so we do this in a couple of ways. Uh, we conduct research um, to increase our shared level of understanding of um, the funding landscape. So questions like, you know, what's getting funded, what's not getting funded, who is funding um, what, and where are there, you know, trends and gaps that we can see. Um, and we use that research to produce strategic uh, recommendations and guidance for key decision makers. Um, we also knowing that some of the knowing about some of the constraints and issues with the way that some of the funding mechanisms that are in place uh, have um, convene key stakeholders to try and pilot and test out some new ways to um, uh, fund open infrastructure. So, for example, what about participatory budgeting or how can a um, vendor reciprocity model work, right? Um, and beyond that, we're also launching a fund ourselves with uh, looking at launching um, early to mid-2024. So in terms of why Europe should care, I think uh, this morning there's a lot of eloquent speakers who spoke about trust. And um, we at IOI have built an evidence base that 
substantiates you know, that open, in particular, in terms of having you know, robust community governance and transparency um, in the ways that we're working, really help promotes trust and encourages stakeholders' participation. And so, which I think we can all agree that that's you know, crucial for not only governments, but also corporates in these days and ages. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I'm Brian Bellendorf. I'm uh, general manager of the Open Source Security Foundation. Uh, it's an organization embedded inside the Linux Foundation, but with its own membership, its own budget, its own uh, remit. And we're interestingly both an organization that recruits uh, funds uh, and also disperses them, uh, uh, but, but it has an operational element to what we do. Probably the bigger part of what we do is operational, but we do uh, disperse some funds in some interesting ways as well. Um, our reason for existence is this recognition recognition that software has often been an or security has often been an afterthought uh, when it comes to open source software and there's a lots of uh, default biases and assumptions that even we as open source developers have had about uh, trust uh, in the software supply chain uh, trust that you know after solar winds after uh, uh, you know weaknesses in open SSL that became very caused a lot of downstream kind of thrash uh, in uh, in the open source world we kind of realized you needed to, to, to think more about how to push security upstream and how to get a better set of tools and processes and, and standards together. Um, it actually came out of a bunch of different conferences and the like about open source security that discovered everyone had these uh, collections of little projects and, and ideas and if we could just put them under one roof and get everyone talking to each other, maybe we'd have something interesting. And so we are this kind of motley assortment of everything from uh, software, uh, such as uh, the SigStore uh, software project, which is about signing of artifacts through the software supply chain. SigStore is also kind of a service. It's a way to look up whether signatures are valid uh, uh, and even kind of a quasi-specification too. There's a couple of different implementations in different languages. Um, uh, there's another project called Security Scorecards and actually a whole set of things we do which are about trying to uh, objectively measure risk in an open source project, like what's the likelihood that there are undiscovered, uh, undiscovered vulnerabilities in the code that could come and uh, be a problem later. Uh, I, I, and uh, um, uh, other work that we do that is about education. How do we help train developers to uh, recognize common anti-patterns <laughs> when it comes to security? Things like parsing untrusted user input, uh, or, or particularly for format strings. Um, and you know, how do we train them to uh, uh, look for those in their own code and, and try to avoid them? Um, what we've discovered is that if you can measure risk, uh, if you can uh, talk about processes that can systematically work them out, you might have a path to raising the floor for security across uh, software, across the, not just the open source software landscape, but really, frankly, the entirety of the, of the software industry, given that uh, by different studies, something like 70 to 90 percent of software sitting inside of any uh, end product is pre-existing open source code. So uh, some of the more exciting things that we've done, uh, I think, uh, have come from, uh, I, well, we have a project called Alpha Omega, which uh, has uh, raised seven and a half million dollars to go and target two very complementary uh, activities. One, uh, going out and trying to scan so, uh, the top 10,000 open source projects to systematically look for uh, new uh, vulnerabilities that look like things that we've discovered before, things that haven't been resolved yet, even though they've been widely known as, as issues out there uh, and proactively issue pull requests to go and fix those uh, and we've got that infrastructure standing up now and we've already discovered a bunch of CVEs and are starting to report that um, the complementary side to that is the alpha side which you could really think of as capacity building amongst other open source foundations in how they work uh, how they deal with security issues uh, and so we've dispersed roughly on average $400,000 grants to Python, to Rust, to jQuery, to Node, uh, and to, one more I'm blanking on, um, I, I, that, no, Eclipse, I'm sorry, I, I, to try and help resource security teams, help them resource adoption of different security practices. And I use the term capacity building very much intentionally uh, because I think of it like the kind of capacity building that development organizations or governments often do when they look at what does it take to systematically go and up-level a, how, how a country feeds its people 
or how a nation state manages its, its democracy or, or other types of capacities, right? Because uh, we're eager to, to help uplift the entire industry kind of project by project and move on to additional projects and, and fund those. Um, so we've, dis we've raised and dispersed a bunch of money to do this work. Um, I, should, I should also note, you know, we had this inflection point uh, about a year ago, right after Log4j, where a whole bunch of people started to ask us, it's nice that you've got these cute projects, but what would it take to actually close and solve some of the issues that are out there, right? What would it take, and this is not a, perhaps a fair question, but to prevent the next log for shell uh, type of vulnerability? And, and just f dialing down on that for a bit, I, I, log, for, log for shell, the vulnerabilities that uh, uh, led to the log for shell breach, had you hired a third party code reviewer, uh, I'll go out on a limb and say it would have been a fifty to hundred thousand dollar project to hire uh, Ostif, for example. I don't know if any of you have. Uh, hopefully, all of you have heard of Ostif. Ostif is an amazing organization that front ends uh, third party code review work uh, and does a lot of other things. Amir Montezari sitting here in this fancy pinstripe suit. Uh, I will tell you all about it. Uh, uh, but um, you know, basically, you can go to them and say we'd like to do an audit of this software project, this package. How much will it cost? He'll go and talk to a bunch of different orgs, come back with a quote, uh, and and then oversee this process that makes sure that it actually solves this for open source communities. Um, so for 50 or 100 grand, I would wager, uh, uh, we could have found those issues and proactively uh, remediated them through a, a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process and kind of avoided the billions of dollars. We don't even know how much disruption resulted from uh, the log for shell incident that happened uh, over a year ago. And all, everyone's ruined uh, winter holidays. I can't tell you what the next log for shell is, uh, but I could give you a list from uh, uh, some of the projects we've done. We have a, a way of looking at what are the most critical projects out there. Here's the list of 200 projects that probably have about a 1% chance of having the next log for shell level breach you know, through a combination of how critical are they and, and what, what are the risk scores that we get from all these uh, studies we can do. So let's do third party code reviews of them, right? What's 100 grand times 200 projects, it's $20 million, right? That's a lot of more money, even 100 grand, even 50 grand is more money than any one open source project tends to have in its back pocket to apply to something like this. But it's, it's pocket change for a lot of, of governments. Not to say it's, not, it's completely non-trivial, like you have to go and justify and show value, but this is the kind of scale that we need to muster if we want to try to solve some of these security issues at scale at, at, and, and, and address them entirely, not just th you know, throw rocks at it and hope to have an impact. But it's also not billions of dollars. It's not trillions of dollars to solve this problem. And so at this point about a year ago, uh, we developed a plan, uh, something that we called the, the, the security mobilization plan that looked at 10 different kind of angles to these challenges to uh, securing open source software in the software supply chain. Uh, funding of third party code reviews was one of them. Funding a, uh, a CERT, uh, an emergency response team for the next under-resourced open source team that finds a bug and doesn't know it, how to manage a disclosure process is another. I mean, there's, I can, I can go on, I don't want to bore folks. I I thought when we put this together, it would be, again, billions of dollars to actually have this kind of impact. It's $150 million, which again is bigger than my budget, bigger than most <laughs> organizations' budgets in the open source lens world, but, but a completely tractable amount, especially if as companies and as governments around the world, we work together to address this. So, so we're really eager to figure out how do we help this collective recognition of the need to make this proactive investment in security hardening and, and, and the, not just the creation of digital public goods, but making them safe, making them consumable, making them uh, the kinds of things that we can build critical infrastructure on top of. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we've had clear answers to why Europe should care. And we're just yeah, at the halfway point or just over it. So um, to make most of the remaining uh, 13 minutes, I think we should focus on two questions, which is going forward, who should be doing what, who should be mobilized, and how should they be doing it, or how should they not be doing it? And by that, I mean, what funding models would you recommend, cooperation that needs to happen, and so on. So perhaps we can start with you, Jean-Luc, since you are working at the European Commission. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so on the WU, uh, I guess uh, everybody that has money is welcome, so it's a very uh, simple answer. Um, we at Commission, we will for sure invest. We have invested, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, in the next generation internet. We are going to invest uh, uh, in the next uh, work program. We have open calls. 
so for instance, we have a, a fund that is uh, with a 27 million euro open. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, we'll, uh, invest also in, uh, in pilots of 14 million euros. Now, uh, the question how is very interesting one. Um, and uh, uh, we at Commission, we, we realize that we are not very well, uh, not necessarily well adapted to uh, target the open source communities. Uh, because uh, we have, you know, very heavy process and it's, it's not necessarily the, the best approach. So the way we work, we work with, in the two steps. We give money to intermediaries that in turn give money to, uh, to uh, open sourcers <coughs> and the people developing the commons. That's what uh, is the term we are starting to use. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, today there are open calls for uh, precisely innovators. Um, and there is a deadline in, in two months, uh, just to be practical. Uh, and uh, we are going to, to have projects that are going to uh, uh, improve the internet in, in the sense that I mentioned. And as example, we have uh, existing community projects, so TechWidgetsy, Big Blue Button. Uh, we are working with uh, uh, the Solid community, the Fediverse community. We have 20 projects. Uh, open hardware is also very important. We have a Risk Five uh, projects, uh, which is uh, from from the Linux Foundation. We have uh, Open Power. Also, we are working on the value chain from design to electrical uh, level. So there are software there, and and we try to. Uh, make sure this is open, uh, open for students to, to democratize the process of moving from the design to the uh, to the layout to the uh, to the open hardware. Uh, that's a few examples. WireGuard was also funded by NGI. And um, we have a lot of uh, projects in relation to, to, to distributed uh, decentralized uh, infrastructure. So uh, the, the common denominator is is openness for sure. Is um, uh, a better uh, privacy. We want to have a, a, an internet that is uh, uh, protecting privacy. Trust is, uh, is another key word. So I guess uh, that's the, the how we are going to, to work. Yes, in few words. Thank you. Uh, Robin, would you like to jump yeah, in? Uh, I think uh, Brian spoke about the risk, but I also want to talk about like uh, the opportunity that it presents Europe and many other geographies, right? So EU has a GDP of $17 trillion. And the cost, to cost, the cost to start a company a decade ago was maybe 10 million. And today, the cost to start a company is literally 100th of that. It's because of this open source infrastructure. So we have to also frame this in the context of innovation. What can happen in the next 20, 30 years? How much money can be added? And I think OFE came up with this amount of $100 billion is added to GDP. right? And so we should get the industry to contribute back. An example of that is a fund we set up with Open Technology Fund, which is a collaboration between GitHub, Okta, Philanthropy, us and Schmidt Futures, and the federal government. So you can experiment with new funding models uh, and get industry to collaborate and contribute back. Tax breaks is an excellent way. Second is, I think uh, European philanthropy should think more actively about de-risking some of this stuff for industry and the government, and take an active participation in thinking about digital commons and open source. Uh, third, I think, is definitely government, right? Uh, and if you set up like a European digital infrastructure fund, 100 million, 500 million, just like the sovereign tech fund in Germany, it's not a lot of capital to think about the next billions of dollars that can be added to the overall GDP. And finally, I think one thing, one idea I've been playing around with is <clears throat> Uh, just like a social impact bond, can we have an open source or a digital infrastructure bond where governments and philanthropies guaranteed on a result uh, actually do intermediation of this fund? Right? Like a bond, it's like a simple bond structure, someone pays for it, and if it is successfully remediated over a three to five year period, governments actually pay for results instead of paying in anticipation of impact. Thank you, Govind. Emmy, would you like to share some thoughts? Yeah, I think I'm going to talk a little bit more on meta level about the, the how to fund, right? I think what um, first thing is that I think there, there needs to be definitely more coordination and transparency um, in terms of how funders are working. Got to walk the talk when we fund open source, right? So, I mean, we see that if anyone's tried to dig into kind of funding data and analyze funding trends, you'll know that this data is actually really, really hard to analyze and obtain because it's just all over the place. and 
not every single, oh, actually a lot of open source projects don't declare how much they've got when for what time, kind of time scale and that sort of thing. So um, without this kind of data, it's really hard to figure out how to coordinate between different funding efforts. And you know, the, the flip side, the downside of that is when you have, for example, um, a certain funder coming into a certain space with a huge amount of investment, what we've seen is it could potentially drive away other smaller funders that were initially kind of funding that space safely. And then that's not an issue. The issue is, you know, when there's, for example, a change in strategic priority in terms of that particular funder, we see that this space of open infrastructure is then left very, very vulnerable. And so I think with more data, with more research in this area, and with, with funders hopefully working more transparently, we can actually have more coordination and avoid those single points of failure and really work towards you know, a more coordinated uh, action to uh, collective efforts to fund, fund this space. So one of my favorite sayings from the last year is that um, you know, it's not, free software isn't necessarily free as in speech or free as in beer, it's free as in puppy. Uh, and I think what's, what's always driven uh, kind of the value exchange and the, the energy of the creation of open source software has been uh, the, the use value that comes from it, uh, from the individuals and the companies really receiving it, working with it, and, and recognizing this kind of implicit uh, obligation to co contribute back. If you're fixing a bug, don't keep that bug fixed to yourself, contribute it upstream, right? If you have an idea for a feature, you know, it, you could write it all yourself and contribute upstream, sure, but you might also find other people willing to help you to do that, right? And so this implicit, like, I got it for free, but I should take some responsibility for my own kind of, like, use of it and pay it forward, right? I mean, that's a very socialist term. I would, I would be called a socialist in the US if I put it in those terms, right? Um, uh, not, not positively. Um, but it's a, actually really a positive thing, in my opinion, right? This proactive pay it forward kind of cycle that we've developed in open source. And so uh, I think the, the, the first thing, and that's, this has always powered open source development, even since uh, Rishabh Ayer Ghosh at the uh, uh, European op Open Source Observatory, he was, was doing some of the first econometric work in open source in like the late 90s. and, and based on surveys and, and other uh, data con uh, concluded it wasn't charity, it wasn't uh, you know, research dollars, it was actually the use value coming from open source that drove so many contributors to that. So that, figuring out how to, how to keep that engine going is critical, I think, to making sure how do we not you know, strangle the goose that laid the golden egg, right? Like, uh, that's, that's the first thing. The second, of course, though, is that uh, there are uh, some institutions uh, that uh, have perhaps been a bit more of a free rider on, on this stuff than others. Um, so the cloud companies, the uh, technology companies, the folks who are close to the bone on some of this stuff, they do recognize that need to pay it forward. There's other organizations that are just now waking up to the need to have OSPOs, for example, right? OSPOs at large companies that are retailers or automotive firms. Thank you very much to, to Continental, who's here, and, and I mean, uh, uh, Mercedes and others. Uh, I'll do this as well. So these kind of end user companies and increasingly smaller companies recognize that even if before they hadn't thought of themselves as a software development operation, they use this stuff, they should, uh, you know, invest in it like a puppy, uh, take care of it like a puppy, uh, and, then, and then also pay it forward. And if government only, government is a massive user of open source code, and if they only invested back upstream into it proportionate to their use of it, the way that happens in the rest of industry, they would be a huge contributor to open source. And what we've seen is that there are, in the United States and a lot of other countries, policies against government uh, uh, employees contributing upstream against government contractors who are typically paid by the hour, you know, uh, contributing upstream. So we need to look at some of those policies and I think if we just made some minor changes, we'd see a lot of, uh, of that kind of funding uh, and that resulting work come in. But then finally, let's look at are there systematic improvements that can be made, particularly around security, which all of us, all of us want somebody else to pay for security work. We want to be able to take it, you know, we want to be able to take it for granted, right? We should be able to take it for granted. The fact, though, is sometimes there's large expenses like a third-party audit. Sometimes there's the kind of expense that goes into paying for things like validating signatures on your upstream dependencies that don't create an immediate benefit for you, so they're not quite a feature, but they're in the long-term benefit for your users and in resiliency against the kinds of attacks that we all hope we don't ever become the subject of, right? So for that kind of investment, foundations are an appropriate way to try to coordinate some of this and pool some of this interest in this effort, but I also think that's a role for governments to play. There's an economist named Mariana Matsukato who has been doing a lot to try to understand the value of public goods 
uh, public infrastructure and the e resulting economic impact that can come from, I mean, bridges and highways, but digital public goods as well. And I think if we had a sober analysis of the economic value being created by improvements into open source code, and then carved out a, a one percent of that value as a as a pay it forward or pay it upstream type of thing, we would we would we would be able to tackle some of these uh, systemic issues. I think we see with security and open source code, but but in other places where open source uh, needs that kind of investment. Uh, thank you, Brian. <clears throat> just conscious of time, we have two minutes left. I have a few more questions I wanted to ask, but I'll just conclude with one last question, which is I'll like to hear from all of you very quickly one thing that you're optimistic about in, ter in terms of open source software funding. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, open source is becoming uh, extremely important. Uh, there are many factors for that, and we d some of us discussed that. So, uh, I ex I'm optimistic about uh, notably the involvement of governments. There are many reasons for that. There is an economic argument. Uh, OFE and Fraunhofer did a study recently that shows that uh, investing in open source brings an, uh, an increase of GDP, an increase of jobs and, and startups. So there is an economic argument. There is a strategic argument because open source is everywhere. Uh, Log4G was uh, revealing for that and it rings a bell for a lot of decision makers. And it's also uh, somehow a geopolitical question. Um, there was a, a study from the, the French Institute of uh, International Relations that explored the logic of regions, Russia, China, uh, and the US, uh, with, uh, with very interesting top-down policies. The, the, the bemol or the, 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 the concern is that when a government enter in this world, which is very bottom-up, grassroots, uh, there may be a, a mismatch. So we have to be careful. Um, Top-down policy do not always fully align with the bottom-up. That, that's one of the, of the message and, and lesson we, 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 we got. So um, it's important to design policies that are exploring uh, the potential of open source, but at the same time, uh, leave the freedom and leave the, 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 the decentralization aspect of, uh, and it's not, it's not easy. I mentioned we, we use intermediaries because commission we are not uh, fully equipped, but at the moment that we have the instrument, it makes sense to start reflecting on a more strategic way. Should we have in Europe an open, uh, uh, an open source operating system for devices, for instance, smartphone? Should we have a, a browser in Europe? Yes, no, should we think about uh, hardware in Europe? But all these questions can only come when, I believe, uh, we have the instrument to address uh, the community because it's a leverage effect that is for us uh, very important. And if we put ourselves in, in a few years from now, I believe the seed we are putting with this amount of money I mentioned, which are not uh, big, with other contributors, with philanthropics, with uh, uh, um, partners, we, uh, we can have, uh, in a few years from now, the, the building blocks, the trusted building blocks open that will um, allow business model to flourish and that will allow also uh, users to have a more trusted experience uh, with the internet. Uh, we have to keep in mind uh, the evolution of AI, the, the intelligent bots, so brains that will work for us. Uh, multiverse that will give uh, an immersive experience as it's close to reality, and the Web3 that will allow transaction almost immediate. So the, this combination can be very powerful, but at the same time, we have to have to, the trusting tools that will allow us to, uh, to do more. Thank you. Um, okay, we're at time, so let's just hear very, very quickly from the rest of the panel, maybe one of you, two sentences. What are you optimistic about, Govind? Uh, I'm seeing a lot of momentum around legislation and capital convening in both US and Europe. And the fact that there are so many people sitting here at 5.30 p.m. listening to us, it's very hopeful. Great. Thank <laughs> Amy? Yeah, likewise. I'm, I'm, because of this panel, I think I'm optimistic in this conference as well. I think there's a will, genuine willingness of all of us coming together to understand what incentives there are for all of us to be in this room and those who are not in this room as well to bring more people into the conversation. And I think that's, you know, the first step to better co coordination and collaboration. 
I'm very optimistic about the governments outside of Europe and America. Not to say I'm not optimistic with the, the ones that are in, but the ones outside, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, uh, in South America, a lot of them are recognizing the need to invest in this systematically and recognize the role it's already playing in their own economies. Thank you. Um, I, I won't sum up in the interest of time, so please uh, join me in thanking our amazing panelists for the panel.